one of the biggest flashpoints in East Asia is in the South China Sea. The Chinese claim 90% of the South China Sea as their sovereign territory. We cannot accept that. This is an ongoing, very dangerous situation between the United States and China. And if they are aggressively seeking to intercept U.S. ships or aircraft, then accidents can, can occur. <laughs> Thanks for joining our Crouching Tiger detective story. So far, our investigation has revealed that China is rapidly building up its military arsenal. If we face 1,000 Chinese anti-ship missiles, there's no way to stop them all. And China wants to take territory from its neighbors. I think it's very clear that China is a revisionist state. What they're doing is they're just inching and slowly, it's not spiraling escalation, it's, if anything, it's salami tactics. Triggers for a possible war include the wild card of North Korea. We have a power in North Korea that is erratic, unpredictable, and increasingly dangerous. And a nationalistic showdown between China and Japan over five small rocks in the East China Sea. The most immediate flashpoint in Asia right now is not Taiwan, it's Japan. In this episode, we look at yet another major flashpoint and one of the major arteries of global commerce, the broad expanse and increasingly tight quarters of the South China Sea. Here's our first clue in question to get us started. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the Chinese were pursuing a charm offensive toward the region. China was following a uh, guideline that was put down by a previous Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, to shelve these disputes and try to seek joint development. So in about 2007, 2008, China started to be more assertive in pressing its claims in the South China Sea. It was the onset of the global financial crisis, and the Chinese saw the United States as weakened by the financial crisis, and it created opportunities for China to, te to test the United States and to try and, uh, and promote its interests in its periphery in the hope that the United States would not respond forcefully. The East China Sea and the South China Sea are important to China for a variety of reasons. We're dealing with the major arteries for globalization. This is an area of vast maritime trade, uh, both energy but also trade in general. All the nations of this region depend on the sea lines of communication for their economic well-being. These are uh, highways through which enormous volumes of maritime traffic pass. More than a third of global trade goes through the South China Sea. And uh, if China wants to become the dominant player in the region, I think from the perspective of Chinese strategists, it's important for them to be able to control the use of those waters. They see the United States now as having that capacity and that role, and they would like to have it themselves. These are increasingly competitive areas with coast guards, navies, airplanes. There's intrinsic value to at least some of this territory and some of this water, primarily because uh, it's believed by many people, particularly in China, that underneath the surface of some of these areas are vast reserves of oil and natural gas. So there are energy resources potentially that China desperately needs. Uh, there are widely varying estimates of, of what the seabed energy deposits might look like in the central part of the South China Sea. We already have Many nations are recovering significant petroleum reserves from the peripheral part of the South China Sea, but the area under the most, uh, under the sharpest dispute is around the Spratly Islands, as they're called, in the central part of the South China Sea. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy uh, estimates that the energy reserves there are not very significant. Uh, China's national overseas oil company, Sinook, has given a, a uh, an estimate of the possible seabed reserves that are orders of magnitude above the DOE estimate with very little fact to back it up. 
China now has big corporations like China National Offshore Oil Corporation, and they want to operate there. So all these interest groups are converging on a more assertive policy. I think that some of these extravagant estimates that we see in, in China are based on one of two factors. One is politicians attempting to build national support for China's position, but a second may be Sinook and other Chinese oil companies trying to garner government support for their operations by saying, here's this very rich target, you ought to finance us great in a more, to a greater degree to go look for oil here. The waters of the South China Sea in particular also are very rich in, uh, in fish, which is extremely important as a source of protein. So marine resources, fisheries, right? We all eat and love fish, so that's, that's an important resource. That it's, it's, we shouldn't un underestimate the impact of that, right? And some of the conflicts, small-scale conflicts in recent years, between the Chinese and the Vietnamese and Indonesians and Filipinos has had to do with fishing rights and who can fish in various waters at what times of year. If you're looking at tensions in the South China Sea, you have no to look no further than the profit motive in some of the provinces that border these, these maritime disputes like Guangxi, Guangdong, and Hainan, all of which have their own sort of calculations, political and economic, in or they, they want to, for example, collect more taxes, so they send their boats further and further out. China, for example, imposes a unilateral fishing ban every year, tries to keep Vietnamese fishermen and Philippine fishermen out of uh, certain uh, waters that actually are not clearly under uh, Chinese sovereignty. So they're pushing the Vietnamese further and further out from their own disputed territories, and that's not in the news. It just happens. You just talk to the Vietnamese, the fishermen, will find one day they'll try to get to the island, they can't. And this is their livelihood as well, right? And Vietnam is constrained to fish further and further out because of overfishing and pollution. So they will continue to have boats in what China sees as its. And so there will continue to be incidents. Now, it may be that China is willing to share this. They claim they are. But they want to share it on their terms, not under the terms of how we would interpret international law. And that's not acceptable. But there's also an, uh, a less tangible piece of this, which is China has had claims to much of the land and water in the South China Sea for as long as the CCP regime has been in power. There has been growing pressure domestically in China to defend Chinese, what they refer to as their core interests. And one of those core interests is the, uh, the territory that uh, China claims and Chinese sovereignty. Uh, over these territories. And in part, this has to do with nationalism. That is a tool that the regime uses to try to bolster public support. So to be able to say, these are rightfully ours. They were taken from us at some point when we were relatively weak, and now we're strong enough to assert ourselves and to take what's rightfully ours, is part of a domestic political game. Uh, that the leadership is playing. And you will probably find today, if you watch a weather report on Chinese TV, that it includes some of these islands and reefs and rocks in the South China Sea, uh, because the Chinese uh, government is telling its people, this is important territory for China. And so, yes, the Chinese government does stoke nationalism, in part because this is a government in China that is not democratically elected. Um, it obviously is the Chinese Communist Party, uh, that is chosen through a very complex party uh, mechanism. Uh, but this is not a, a, a party that has uh, very strong legitimacy. And there's a great deal of insecurity at the top that the Chinese people uh, might turn against the government if the Chinese government is not, and party is not, defending uh, Chinese interests, and particularly its, uh, its territory. China has put out a nine-dash line. It's called the cow's tongue because that's the shape that it defines. That covers about 80% of the water and the territory and the land features in the South China Sea, which is shared by a number of other countries, including four other Southeast Asian claimants, and also by Taiwan. And it is one of the most dangerous claims made by any country in the world today, because China is trying to close off the South China Sea. It was originally a 11-dash line, 
you have the 1947 created by Jean Kai-shek's regime uh, was then an 11 dash line. Two of the dashes came off in the 1950s when China and Vietnam agreed on the Gulf of Tonkin and they took those dashes off. It goes almost down to Indonesia. The Chinese want, for instance, the Natuna Islands from Indonesia, so far from China that it's almost inconceivable that Beijing could maintain such a claim, and yet they do so. Recently, China's added a 10th dash to show that Taiwan is clearly within China. It really would make the uh, South China Sea a Chinese lake if those were to be the territorial waters of China. This brings it into conflict with Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, Vietnam. It's really a line that the Chinese communists inherited from the Guomindang, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, and they don't want to be less steadfast defenders of Chinese sovereignty than Chiang Kai-shek was. So in a sense, part of the story is they've inherited a line they now have to defend, even though the world's a rather different place. And so right now, this nine-dash line is a flashpoint. To claim the South China Sea would be the equivalent of Mexico claiming the Gulf of Mexico not acceptable to the United States, not a, a, acceptable to any of the states around the South China Sea. It is a preposterous claim built on an ancient concept, namely that any area that any previous Chinese d dynasty has touched is by virtue of that Chinese territory. There is the troubling habit of the Chinese to claim that wherever Chinese pottery is found, then in that case, that presumably was once part of Chinese territory. What makes it especially destabilizing is that China has not clarified what it really means. Uh, one possibility is that China might just claim uh, the land features and the adjacent waters inside that line. That would not cover all of the waters in, uh, in the South China Sea or indeed within the Nine Dash Line. But because China has been very vague and ambiguous, it's, it's unclear. And if China were to claim every drop of water within the Nine Dash Line, that would include waters within other countries' EEZs. So when the Chinese suddenly put the map of the Nine Dash Line on every Chinese citizen passport, that was basically a statement to say, this is our sovereign territory in water. Well, if you're in the Philippines and Vietnam, you're saying, well, where's our water? Where's our territory? Um, it's a flagrant, assertive, and provocative action. One of the huge strategic issues with China is how do you deal with salami slicing? What they're doing is they're just inching and slowly, it's not spiraling escalation, it's if anything, it's salami tactics. Salami slicing is a strategic concept where China does never put on enough pressure to get a, a military pushback, but just enough to seize territory. China has not launched a large-scale invasion since 1979 when it invaded Vietnam. Instead, it has used what are called salami slicing tactics to make advances in increments so as not to invite retaliation. One of the concepts in China is not a Western concept of strategy where we see something, decide how we're going to make it happen and make it happen. The Chinese strategy is more to think what you'd like to happen and wait for the right opportunity. And so when uh, South Vietnam was in deep trouble, collapsing, we had withdrawn our support. And before their ally North Vietnam had taken South Vietnam, they seized some of the Paracels because it was they seizing from South Vietnam who could not take it back. And then they did nothing with them for almost 30 years. Only recently have they started to build on them to establish administrative control. That's kind of a salami slice. It has succeeded some by salami tactics. Some of those salami tactics have been in reaction to claims by other countries. It's not clear, but it might be the case that China would have tried anyway. We don't know. China has, on many occasions, not all, waited for another claimant to make a move before it makes you know, a much more, uh, a much harsher move. So it, you could put it like this, like if the Philippines gives a three, China will give back a nine, right? So if you look at Scarborough Shoal, for example, which is where, you know, the, the Philippines sent in a Navy cutter. Um, it was, you know, a boat that we provided them as their only one. And it happened to be there because it was looking at um, North Korea, nor debris from a North Korean nuclear test. Sent in its only Navy cutter to deal with a fishing dispute, right?
Now that's sort of equi equivalent to sending in a SWAT team to deal with a parking ticket. So China was incensed. So China came in and eventually, we won't get into the details, has now roped off the whole shoal and controls it with maritime law enforcement, not with Navy ships. You just sort of peel off one piece of atoll or one atoll after the next and pretty soon you've you've got yourself a set of facts that mirror this nine dash line and you in the end possession is nine tenths of the law and so you've you've actually presented the world with a set of fatal complies about which you don't any longer feel you have to negotiate uh, and I think that's quite frankly, probably the strategy China's pursuing. It's a, a strategy difficult for us because, in effect, many of these atolls are not a, uh, a national interest of the United States. The Chinese did not invent salami slicing. In fact, we know where they learned it from. They learned it from the Japanese in the 1930s when a very militant Tokyo was grabbing chunks of northeastern China away from Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of China at the time. Now China is employing salami slicing tactics against Japan and against other countries in the region, again trying to make small advances so that nobody will notice. And so far they've been successful. What the United States has done is not resisted these salami tactics, and so we have taught the Chinese that aggression works. important salami tactic has been to use non-military vessels in a military fashion. One of the most interesting tactics that the Chinese have used in the South China Sea is to avoid deploying warships, but rather to deploy white hulls, which are non-military but official vessels. China has built itself a very large number of law enforcement ships. China has a collection of law enforcement agencies which have now mostly coalesced into effectively the Chinese Coast Guard. Now they're armed like a Coast Guard, at least minimally, and they're big and they have many assets, both air assets and naval assets. China has deployed these maritime vessels on a regular basis, and they've surrounded Philippine fishing boats, they've surrounded American warships. It's non-militarized coercion what they're doing. They've never employed the military. The military sits back. They usually wait for a so-called so provocation from another side. So for instance, its marine surveillance observation vessels are small ones, and yet they are accomplishing what you would expect to see from naval vessels. A truly maritime strategy incorporates not just navies, but, it, but, is, uh, but also shore-based uh, hardware, uh, aircraft and missiles and so forth. But it also, in it also incorporates law enforcement assets. And for the Chinese, it also, inc it also includes at times the fishing fleet, these things that we would think of as commercial vessels. They act as an unofficial arm of Chinese sea power at times. Beijing uses its white hulls as the tip of the spear. Behind that is the Chinese Navy, the gray hulls over the horizon. And what's waiting over the horizon is, is a new uh, aircraft carrier, right? Is our new jets that are coming online. Submarines, surface ships, amphibious ships, and aircraft. And of course, they're perfectly obvious on the radar. Everyone can see them. Yeah, I think the asymmetry between white hulls and gray hulls is very important. Uh, I, think I think that the Chinese are very, are very deft, deft at using these Coast Guard cutters to, uh, to essentially stake their claims. These are police assets. Uh, the other Coast Guards uh, ringing in the South China Sea are not, near, are not nearly big enough or strong enough to stand up to, to the, the China, even the China Coast Guard in a one-on-one -on -one sense. We saw this in the early part of 2012 when the Chinese grabbed Scarborough Shoal from Manila. And Scarborough Shoal had been considered to be part of the Philippines for almost from time immemorial. And so the Chinese now have the capability, and this really began in, in uh, the latter half of the first decade of the 21st century, to sail around the South China Sea and to enforce uh, China's claims in ways that they could not have done uh, previously. The civilian paramilitary forces uh, of, of China are really the ones that China's neighbors interact with the most. So if you're on a reef and a shoal out in the South China Sea, or even today if you're out near the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands in the East China Sea, you're, you're dealing with the Chinese Coast Guard. Or you're in South China Sea, you're dealing with fisheries patrols that now have a much, much more uh, strict 
enforcement of fisheries rules made by China, not negotiated with neighbors, but made and emanating from China. And they're able to be pushing around the smaller navies in the region and to essentially dominate. Uh, and in fact, during the 1974 battle in the, in the uh, Spratleys and Paris cells, uh, the Chinese took, uh, took great pride in touting the accomplishments of their, of their uh, fishing fleet as essentially armed militia at sea that helped them, that helped them swamp, the, swamp the South Vietnamese Navy. They call it people's war at sea. So this is a very holistic uh, view of what sea power is, and the Chinese are very ma maritime to a, to a greater degree, I would argue, even than the United States. Our Navy is very tactically focused. It's, all, it's focused entirely on military things. I think we've had a hard time getting our minds around the idea that a Coast Guard cutter can be an implement of sea power uh, and go out and cre essentially create a new normal. They are deliberately not militarizing the problem. And uh, therefore, they uh, are creating this sort of gray zone area where they use their law enforcement ships, uh, but there is very little way of pushing back against them. So that when there's a confrontation, uh, the, the image of the confrontation is, let's say, an American warship challenging a civilian fishing vessel. This makes it quite difficult, frankly, for the United States to respond. Essentially, they, in order to counteract these, these uh, China Coast Guard patrols, they would have to use naval force. And if, if, there was a, if it came to shooting, who's going to look like the bad guy? Well, the Navy is probably going to look like the bad guy going out and abusing the China Coast Guard, which is simply going about its normal business. That's a serious asymmetry that, we've, that I think we are still coming to terms with and uh, trying to figure out how, how do you counter such a strategy. The strategy of using the white holes and keeping the gray holes over the horizon uh, is sometimes not immensely effective with the United States, but it is effective with a country like the Philippines or with uh, Vietnam or with Brunei uh, because they don't have the naval resources to fend off uh, these white holes ships, Chinese ships, Coast Guard ships from their own fish fishing vessels. If you want to look like you're the sovereign of the South China Sea, as China claims to be, then send out police assets and start policing the South China Sea as though you're already sovereign. Over time, if nobody can push back effectively, then, then effectively China has made itself, uh, it's, actually, it's actually fulfilled its aims and made itself the sovereign uh, and essentially created a new normal, carved out an exception for itself in, in the uh, South China Sea, much as the United States did it to a much more limited degree back in, the, back in the days of the Monroe Doctrine. In January 2014, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe compared his relationship with China to that between England and Germany in 1914, the year World War I broke out. A month later, Philippine President Benigno Aquino compared the West's policies towards China to those of the West in 1938, and he specifically referenced the Sudetenland, which was the part of Czechoslovakia that England agreed to give to Hitler. I'm not saying that the People's Republic of China is the same as the Third Reich. Of course it isn't but the dynamic that we are seeing today resembles earlier periods. And it is for that reason uh, that the United States must provide support to these small countries because our will and our capacity to assist them in this area is being tested. And that's, that is exactly what the Chinese wish to do. They, uh, they wish to, to raise the question of our ability and our willpower in terms of being in the South China Sea to assist the smaller nations. And of course you can say, my goodness, where's America's national interest here? Why are we doing this? And the answer is that you cannot stand alone in global affairs these days. You must have the support of friends and local allies. You have to have a place to park your jet fuel, your diesel fuel for the ships that are operating. You have to have warehouses for food and uh, repair facilities for airplanes. Where are you going to put those? You have to have them in countries that are friendly and supportive. Well, there are a few places that come to mind, like the Philippines, Brunei, a few other places. That's why you do it.
But it's not just the possibility of America coming to the defense of one of its South China Sea allies that could trigger a broader war. China has also begun to directly challenge one of America's most fundamental principles, freedom of navigation, which leads us to our next clue in question. In 1982, the United Nations uh, came out with uh, a new set of maritime regulations, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the acronym for which is UNCLOSE. So what UNCLOSE says is that any uh, resource that is within a country's 200-mile exclusive economic zone, if it extends from the coastline, that belongs to that nation. But an aircraft flying over the exclusive economic zone or a ship transiting the exclusive economic zone does not, according to UNCLOS, require permission from the host nation. The Chinese beg to differ. They say that, in fact, China reserves the right to restrict military activities inside the coastal states, EEZ. This is the point of contention between the United States and China. The United States says there's no limit on its ships oper or aircraft operating within the exclusive economic zone, certainly. China says there is. They say if a warship comes into their EEZ, it needs permission. We say no. We cannot accept the limitation or the closing off of any of the global maritime uh, throughways. Under the international rules of the road, freedom of navigation means military patrols do not require advance notification and certainly not permission. So from China's perspective, any foreign military aircraft or ship steaming within that 200 nautical mile limit is required to ask permission from the host nation to do so. From a U.S. perspective, freedom of navigation dictates that a foreign ship or aircraft is not required to request host nation permission to steam within the exclusive economic zone outside of sovereign territorial waters. So we have a conflict between the desire of the U.S. Navy and, uh, and other, almost every other big Navy in the world to have unencumbered transit in those exclusive economic zones, not only China's, but everywhere else uh, in the world. The United States is committed to freedom of navigation, freedom of movement across the maritime commons. The Chinese claim 90% of the South China Sea as their sovereign territory. They call it a core interest. We cannot accept that. We cannot accept the limitation or the closing off of any of the global maritime uh, throughways. From the beginning of the American Republic, we have been interested in freedom of commerce, freedom of navigation. Well, we had to be. We were an island nation. There was a clear understanding from the very beginning of the American Republic that this was and is a maritime nation, that it depends upon the seas for commerce, uh, that commerce is a large part of the American economy, and that it must be protected by force. Freedom of navigation patrols have been American policy for 50 years. We have to continue that. American national security and global interests can be threatened when the principle of freedom of navigation is, is violated. We have stood up for this for 200 years. It is the core of uh, our economy because we are a trading nation, we're a maritime nation. We were trading with China from the late 1700s and trading with Asia. We have maintained a Pacific presence, a permanent Pacific presence, since the latter half of the 1800s. And we've never gone away and we are now a permanent Pacific power. But that means we depend on the fact that the sea lanes have to remain open, stable, and secure. If China's view on sovereign territorial rights within the exclusive economic zone and possibly all the way out to the 350 nautical mile continental shelf limit were to prevail worldwide, it would severely restrict freedom of navigation potentially. If China controls the first 200 nautical miles from its coast, it is the dominant East Asian power. The United States would not be able to engage in a whole host of military operations along the first island chain that in my view uh, has underwritten security and stability in the region. Uh, and so just even that single difference of interpretation leads to a very different regional order.
if the United States did not push back and China were allowed to have its say over how to interpret international law and to say the exclusive economic zone is our domain and you can't enter it with a military warship or even a Coast Guard ship without our permission, they would dominate both the East and the South China Seas. And that's what they want. The ability to to, to get to actually carry on foreign commerce and foreign military activities is really the basis of the United States position in the world. If the United States does not have the freedom unfettered to move uh, ships, uh, Marines, and so on and so forth into the theater, into Asia, uh, it, will really see, it will really see its strategic position in Asia unraveled almost overnight. And uh, by freedom of navigation, I mean not just warships, but also commercial trade afloat. It would have very serious consequences. If China's interpretation of the restrictions on sailing in a nation's EEZ were, ado were adopted, one third of the world's oceans would be barred from having Navy ships, uh, ships of other countries sail in them. Uh, so it would, it would block off a very huge portion of the oceans to uh, nations of the world. When merchant ships travel at sea, they don't steam randomly from port to port. There are sort of, I guess you could say there are highways at sea. So a, sh a merchant ship steaming, say, from Long Beach to uh, Abadan in the Persian Gulf uh, or to Oman, uh, if we broke out a chart, we could lay out exactly the course that ship is going to steer because they want to save fuel and they want to go by the most direct, most economical route. Uh, many of those routes go obviously well within exclusive economic zones. So if these ships are somehow restricted in their transit, it could very much slow and increase the expense of uh, seaborne trade. That is something that the, U the U.S. Navy in particular um, is very opposed to. The two theorists that I usually apply to this are ones that you'll hear when you talk to the people who study law of the sea, historical law of the sea. Uh, first is Grotius, famously known as the author of the, of the Law and War, of War and Peace. He was one of the architects of, he was a Dutchman, of course, he was one of the architects of the free sea, mare liberum, uh, na namely the, the, the idea that the sea is a commons which any nation can use uh, and, and with, with, that, with its uh, uses of the sea unfettered by, by others. But one of his great uh, rivals was an Englishman, John Selden. Of course, uh, Great Britain and, uh, and, and the Netherlands are going head to head in the 17th century about issues about, uh, regarding freedom of the sea. Selden says no. Selden says essentially Great Britain owns the seas around the, around the United Kingdom, around, around what is today the United Kingdom, the British Isles. And it almost in the South China Sea and places like this, it seems as though China is pushing that Selden view. Uh, the idea of the closed sea within the within the first island chain, whether, whereas the United States and its partners and under the law of the sea are trying to push the, the grocious view. Americans don't understand the history. They don't realize the fact that our power, our status as a great power is inseparable from our status as a dominant naval power. And the corollary that if that dominant naval power is surrendered, it is, there is no example in history of a country being able to recover it. One of the major irritants for U.S.-China relations, in the South China Sea in particular, has been the regular U.S. surveillance activities. The United States is daily sending p p military airplanes and uh, reconnaissance trawlers up and down the Chinese coast. Now, just imagine the Chinese would do this to our east and west coast. What would happen? What would happen? I mean, the really Congress would go ballistic. And uh, this is like when Russia put stuff in Cuba. Uh, the, the, our military buildup would go through the roof, and they would consider it a major act of aggression by China. If, it, if, if they had put the Marines in Mexico, uh, the way we tried to put them uh, in bases around China, we would go berserk. When you think about the incidents that have arisen between the U.S. and China, um, the first point you could make is to go back to the Cold War, even though we're not in a Cold War with China, but look at where two large militaries, the Soviet Union and the United States Armed Forces, were in constant contact with each other in the air and on the surface of the, of the seas, and there were crashes, there were incidents. And that's why they put together mechanisms to deal with some of these incidents, like the incidents at sea agreement and then the dangerous military uh, incidents avoidance agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. Jump to today, the United States and China, 
And you can look at, since the turn of the century, we've had three major incidents, and there have been a number of minor incidents, and maybe incidents that have not been reported. And so we saw in 2001, uh, where there was a particularly hot-headed Chinese pilot um, that flew his aircraft uh, right into a U.S. surveillance plane. The Chinese fighter flew too close, uh, flew into the American plane. Uh, we almost lost the entire American crew. Uh, the Chinese pilot was killed. Uh, this is the, the worst example so far where the differing interpretations of the sovereign territory rights within the EEZ under the Young Close uh, led to a tragedy. A similar incident, nobody was killed, thank goodness, in the incident in 2009. In 2009, um, the Impeccable, a U.S. naval listening ship, was harassed by a variety of different Chinese ships, law enforcement agency ships in particular. The case of the Impeccable, of course, would be a very uh, case in point where they cut a tow to ray that this survey research ship was, was pulling. A third incident occurred in um, late 2013 where a U.S. Navy ship was once again um, harassed by the Chinese. What took place in the case of the Cowpens was that China's aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, was on its maiden voyage in the South China Sea. And the United States wanted to track it and conduct surveillance, and so it sent the uh, Cowpens uh, to monitor it. Uh, the Chinese believed that the Cowpens got too close to the Liaoning and the other ships that were sailing to protect the aircraft carrier. Uh, those two ships could easily have collided. This is despite the fact that in 2008, China and the United States agreed that they need some kind of maritime military cooperation mechanism to avoid incidents at sea. The problem is, in 2009, when the impeccable happened, the United States Armed Forces picked up the telephone. The Chinese didn't pick up the phone. These incidents have played a major role in, in fostering tensions. This is an ongoing, very dangerous situation between the United States and China because the Chinese um, view the United States' presence as illegal, and if they are aggressively seeking to intercept U.S. ships or aircraft, then accidents can, can occur. I think international law is on the side of the U.S. On, on this, but I think there's something underneath this. is surveilling the Chinese coast regularly, transiting ships in ways that the Chinese find to be not friendly. It consists of U.S. surveillance and reconnaissance uh, activities uh, that take place very frequently um, in the air, on the sea. Now, why would the U.S. be particularly interested in surveillance in this particular area, that is the northern part of the South China Sea? Well, uh, obviously part of the interest is in this surveillance is because China is building uh, uh, major naval facilities and is, is re-equipping them and engaged in new deployments, especially of nuclear submarines, down to that area. So the reasons why the U.S. is undertaking this surveillance are quite obvious. We want to know about all of these because they, they could conceivably threaten either our homeland or our regional forces and so forth. So uh, it's certainly understandable why the U.S. Navy or and other uh, arms of the U.S. Uh, security community want to surveil. The United States wants to be able to know what they are doing there and the absence of Chinese transparency in its military program uh, makes it even more important that the United States know everything that China is, is doing. It doesn't want to be surprised. The Chinese find this not friendly and highly invasive. For Americans it, it is worth some deep reflection on uh, where we've been with China, uh, not just in the last, not just since 1972, not just since 1945, but well before that. And history tells us that American naval ships were patrolling the Yangtze River after uh, 1853 for nearly 100 years. And that's quite striking to consider. And so I think the United States probably ought to think, how often does it need to assert its right and continue in these behaviors? Let's examine the situation in reverse, where Chinese uh, naval sh ships' boats had been uh, patrolling the Mississippi River, say, for 100 years. Uh, 
you know, one can imagine that would have a huge impact on how Americans saw the world. Well, this, this is clearly true in China. I would be inclined to be less provocative while maintaining our right of unrestricted uh, uh, transit and so forth. Uh, we might lose a little intelligence. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I'm willing to accept that that might be. But it's quite clear to me this is highly provocative. And I think if the U.S. Uh, de-escalated, so to speak, its surveillance of China so close in, uh, then we could say, we're not changing our basic policy, but we'll try to be less irritating to you. That surveillance uh, pattern can be reduced uh, safely. I think we can get this uh, intelligence uh, from other means. But China, I think, could incentivize the United States to reduce its surveillance if China was willing to uh, quite uh, radically increase its level of military transparency. With the Soviet Union, we lived with a lot more than we are currently living with with China. And if we get in this escalatory sequence, we're going to face more and more uh, at a higher level of threat. So I think you have to weigh the current dangers of not knowing everything you'd like to know, perhaps, uh, against what you do know, and that is that your surveillance is causing negative reactions that are leading to, to buildup. And this is not a, a science, this is an art. But you, you either want to be able to deal with threat, that's the, the, the Navy's approach, or you want to avoid increasing threat, which is, of course, the diplomat's approach. And I guess at this moment, I'm willing to try the diplomat's approach. The United States has very profound concerns about um, military transparency in China. Just to give one simple example, uh, it's not infrequent that Chinese military platforms, that the world learns about them through pictures that appear on the internet. And that, you know, is clearly out of step with global norms about how uh, militaries behave and how military development is conducted. This is a live issue. This issue is not going away. I believe that China will continue to ratchet up pressure against the United States to coerce it, in other words, to pull back and to no longer conduct surveillance, uh, as a routine matter at least, within the exclusive economic zones of China. I think this is China's intended objective. That is, they want to not only build up their military to push us back for a potential conflict, they actually want it just so they have more influence and space over this region. And so we have in the South China Sea an increasingly tense situation in which a rapidly militarizing China is indeed ratcheting up the pressure, not just on the United States, but on its neighbors as well. And so in our next episode of Crouching Tiger, we must inevitably turn our investigation to exploring the unthinkable. If China does indeed attack America or American allies in Asia, should the U.S. respond with an attack on the Chinese mainland, an attack that may well invite a nuclear response by the People's Liberation Army and its vaunted Second Artillery Corps? <music>